In our last lesson, we continued our discussion of Fermat's theorem. We saw how Germain broke Fermat's theorem into two cases, and she proved Fermat's theorem for uh, what she called case one for each prime that has an auxiliary prime, and that is where we ended our lesson. But where does the story of Fermat's theorem go on from there? Fermat's theorem oftentimes, as we have mentioned, is associated with the founding of modern mathematics, and we have seen how the questions that Fermat has posed led to the development of the ideas in this course. But with Fermat's theorem in particular, we actually can trace the initial ideas of what are now what is now known as the theory of rings. We started our course by taking the this as a definition, and we saw how in our axioms for the integers, the integers satisfies these axioms and is the ring. When we talked about the integers modulo n, that gave us another example of a ring. Then we got to the Gaussian integers, and we saw that that was also a ring. And as part of the homework assignment, you consider similar uh, situations like the Gaussian integers, where we also have the same ring structure. But the notion of a ring is actually rather recent, dating back to 1914, when it became popular to axiomatize mathematics based on the language that George Cantor introduced in set theory in 1974. And so Abraham, Abraham Frankel was the first to introduce the axioms of an integers, uh, sorry, not the axioms of the integers, but the axioms of a ring, as well as the axioms upon which number theory is, uh, is built, the sermelo frankel axioms. But the initial definition of a ring that Frankel used was rather um, not necessarily complicated, but it did not attract as much attention. And that was more by the notation and, and what he, had, he was working towards that did not lead to as much applications in a general viewpoint as what came later, specifically with the work of Emmy Noether in 1921. Her work not only improved upon Frankel's original definition of a ring, but introduced the notion of ideals. And through that study, that led to the modern foundations of ring theory. And a good, collection, uh, a good chunk of rings is named in her honor, known as Noetherian rings. The rings that we have encountered in this course are all examples of Noetherian rings. And if you take a course in commutative algebra, that is one of the main objects of study. Now, Emmy Noether, she got her PhD in 1907 and did monumental work in number theory and physics early on, but was unable to get an academic position. In fact, in 1915, David Hilbert and Felix Klein attempted to get her a position at the University of Göttingen. They were not successful, however. The faculty at the University of Göttingen voted against the appointment of Emmy Noether, and in fact, during the debates, one faculty member protested, what will our soldiers think when they return to the university and find that they are required to learn at the feet of a woman? David Hilbert responded, to this with indignation, stating, I do not see that the sex of the candidate is an argument against her admission as a private citizen. After all, we are a university, not a bathhouse. In retaliation to not getting appointed at the University of Cottingham, David Hilbert found a loophole in which Emmy Noether would be able to teach at the university, but not in an official capacity. He would take part of his salary to pay Emmy Noether, and she would lecture under his name, and so courses were advertised as being taught by David Hilbert, when in fact it was Emmy Noether who will be teaching those courses. And in this capacity, she was able to also have graduate students. Over the next four years, she began venturing more into, abstract, into what we now will call abstract algebra and starting to lay the foundations for the theory of rings. By 1919, the university actually began to recognize her and gave her a position, although not tenured. So she now, but she was now recognized as a faculty member in a prestigious uh, position, but again, not tenured and also without pay. And, but she, she would remain at the University of Cottingham uh, throughout the 20s. And then in 1933, with the rise of Hitler to power, uh, she was forced to flee Germany. 
and she came to the United States where she was a professor at the at Bryn Mawr College. And for our or our discussion of Aminoter is again with uh, with as it pertains to the theory of rings, but her contributions are also seen in physics as well as the mathematics of the time number theory and the foundations of algebraic number theory for that matter. Now her work in 1921, this introduced the notion that the modern notion of what we call a ring as well as ideals. And ideals is going to be the connecting thread to Fermat's theorem in our discussion in that if we trace back where this definition comes uh, where this definition comes from, it actually returns back to Ernst Kummer's proof of Fermat's theorem in a special case. And so the plan for today is to build to discuss Kummer's theorem and the ideas that go, go into it, but we're not going to prove the result, but just more of getting appreciation for what is this terminology of ideals and how they play a role in the final proof of Kummer's work, at least as from 1847. Now, before we do that, I want us to just discuss uh, Emmy Noether's work in further detail and see how the foundation of ring theory actually arises through her work and how it connects to the topics we have discussed up to now, namely the Gaussian integers and some of its friends that you encountered in the homework assignments. So with that in mind, let us go ahead and make a definition of terminology that we have seen already and one that is new, so namely irreducible. We have not discussed that, but let's go through these definitions one by one. So we're going to take a ring R, and just to emphasize, since now we're going to be talking about these things in generality, at the start of the course, we made a assumption on our definition of a ring, and specifically one of the axioms is that multiplication is always commutative. That is, if we have A times B, then it is equal to B times A for every A, B, in that ring. If you have taken abstract algebra or when you take abstract algebra, one thing that you'll notice is that the, the actual definition of a ring is does not require that we have commutativity. And so we can allow to have non-commutative rings. But for our purposes, everything is going to be commutative under multiplication. And so let's go ahead and suppose we have such a ring that is commutative. We have A, D, and U in the ring. Then we say, as we have come to see in various occasions that d divides a, if we can find some k in the ring such that a is equal to k times d, so that matches up with what we have seen. The next definition is that of a unit, which we encountered in our discussion of the Gaussian integers. And we say that u is a unit if there is some w in the ring such that u times w is equal to 1. So in other words, u is a unit if it has a multiplicative inverse in the ring. And now comes the new definition, which we have seen, but we call this prime earlier. And now we're going to change the name. So we say that a non-zero element P, and actually there's a typo here, this should be non-zero and non-unit for both the, the definition 3 and 4. So we say a non-zero, non-unit element P in the ring is irreducible if for every A, B in the ring R, with p equals a times b, then a is a unit, or b is a unit. And so when we talked about the Gaussian integers, this was the definition we took for prime. But when generalizing, we have to be careful, because what is considered prime, in terms of definition, does not necessarily match up with irreducible. It turns out that in the Gaussian integers, definition 3 and 4 are equivalent. And so what we define prime in abstract algebra is the following. We say that a non-zero, non-unit element P in R is prime. If P divides A times B for any A, B in R, then that implies that P divides A or P divides B. So why do we need to be careful about irreducible and prime? Well, that is easily answered by considering an example from the homework. So we're going to be looking at the ring. The integers adjoin the square root of negative 5. So this is the ring of elements of the form a plus b times the square root of negative 5, where a and b are integers. And as part of the homework, you consider the following two factorizations of 6. 
you we have that 2 times 3 is equal to 6, which is equal to 1 plus the square root of negative 5. And then we also have 1 minus the square root of negative 5. And in your homework, you showed that both of these, that 2, 3, 1 plus root negative 5, 1 minus root negative 5, that these are all prime. But that's actually not true, at least in the definition that we have in front of us. What you actually showed for homework is that they are irreducible. It turns out that 2, 3, and then 1 plus or minus root negative, square root of negative 5, each of these, while irreducible, none of these are prime. And let's see why. Well, if we take 1 plus root negative 5, we know that this divides 6, which we can write as 2 times 3. So we are matching up the definition for the assumptions of what it means to be prime. We have p divides a, b. But then that implies that p divides a, or p divides b, if p is in fact prime. But now, we actually have that 1 plus the square root of negative 5 does not divide 2, and it does not divide 3. And so consequently, we have that 1 plus or minus, well, we did this for five, square root of negative 5, that this is irreducible, but not prime. And actually, the same holds for the for 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, and 1 minus the square root of negative 5. And so what happens is, as we allow ourselves to generalize, the notion of irreducible is the one that actually matches up with our intuition for what it means to be prime in the integers, since prime ends up having a much stronger condition, as we have seen here. Irreducible, we have that each of these are irreducible, but not prime. But it does, the converse is true. If you are prime, then you are irreducible. And in the Gaussian integers, these two notions are equivalent. And what we are going to see in just a moment is that irreducible is equivalent to prime whenever a fundamental theorem of arithmetic holds for that ring. And this is where we get into Emmy Noether's work. The Gaussian integers were the fundamental theorem of arithmetic for them that we saw was proven by Gauss in 1834. The Eisenstein integers, which is the third root of unity, taken along the integers with the third root of unity, the setting for the cubic the law of cubic reciprocity, as well as the n equals to three case of Fermat's theorem, its fundamental theorem of arithmetic can be seen implicitly from the work of Euler in 1770, which what allowed him to prove Fermat's theorem in the n equals to three case. So while both of these are rings. They have a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. The ideas of working through these rings, it's up to, all the way up to Emmy Noether's work, was a matter of start off with your ring and then try to prove a division theorem. Once you have a division theorem, then you can go ahead and prove a basis lemma. And then once you have a basis lemma, then you can continue to build up and eventually prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. The theory of rings, as it was introduced by Emmy Noether and her students in the years that followed, it saw this be done axiomatically. What if we look at what the integers, the Gaussian integers, and all these rings have in common to get to a division theorem? What if we start off by assuming that a ring already has a division theorem? So namely, what we call a Euclidean domain. And so these are, this is the general construct that the Gaussian integers, the Eisenstein integers, the integers themselves all satisfy the axioms for this. And so specifically, we define a ring R to be a Euclidean domain if we have the following conditions hold. That if we have A times B is equal to zero, then that implies that A equals zero or B equals to zero. So this notion in abstract algebra is given a different term. So this here is defined as an integral domain. 
So any ring that has this property that AB equals zero implies that A equals zero or B equals zero for each A, B, and R, that is the concept of an integral domain, hence the part over here that says domain for Euclidean domain. So we have a ring R, it's an integral domain, so it has this property. If, if, if we have that, then we say that a ring R is a Euclidean domain if we have a function n, which we call the norm, and this function goes from its inputs are in the ring and its outputs are in the natural numbers union zero. And we have that the norm of zero is equal to zero. And we also want this function to yield a division theorem. And so here now, we're t whenever we say Euclidean domain, we are taking for granted the existence of a division theorem. So namely, we have a norm, and we have a division theorem, that is, if we have a, b, and r, with b not equal to zero, then there exists elements q and r in the ring r, such that a is equal to b times q plus r, with r is equal to zero, or norm of r being less than norm of b. So what this tells us is that the integers are Euclidean domain, the Gaussian integers are Euclidean domain, and when we were talking about Lagrange's theorem, we talked about polynomials over fields. And one of the crucial results that we relied on was a division theorem for polynomials. And so now we have that the ring of polynomials in one variable is also a Euclidean domain because we have a division theorem, where now the norm in that situation would be the map, the degree map. And so these are all, this is how we see this generalization of the ideas that we have discussed now being generalized to, to include a more general class. And what this allows us to do is instead of doing what we did for the Gaussian integers, if we were to do it for the Eisenstein integers, we would have to go through, check what the norm map is, and then go through and prove each of the results. The general setup says, let's assume this definition of a Euclidean domain. So we have a division theorem. So based on any Euclidean domain, then we can prove on these assumptions, the same proof that we did for Bayesian lemma will hold. And so we can now prove Bayesian lemma for all Euclidean domains. And then we can go in the same way that we did for the Gaussian integers. Each of those results that we did, we can abstract and then see that each of the, those results will hold in general for Euclidean domain, eventually getting us to the proof of a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. The only difference is that instead of saying that we have a unique factorization in terms of primes, because prime is not the same as irreducible, what we will say is that we have a unique factorization in terms of irreducibles. And this is the idea of a unique factorization domain. So we say a ring R that is an integral domain, so we have that that second assumption here, we have a, b is equal to zero, implies a is equal to zero, or b is equal to zero for each a, b in the ring. So we say that ring R is a unique factorization domain. If every non-zero element R in the ring, which is not a unit, can be written uniquely as a finite product of irreducibles up to order and unit. And so that is, if we have the following factorizations of some non-zero non-unit element R, where we have p1, p2 all the way to pn is equal to r, but we also have q1 and q2 all the way through qm is equal to r. Then we have, with each, of course, each p sub j, q sub k being irreducible in the ring r, then we have that n is equal to m, and after a reordering, we can find units u1 through un, such that p sub j is equal to u sub j times q sub j for each j. And so this is just the a ring in which we have a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And as I mentioned, if we start off with Euclidean domain and we go through the same process that we did in our course for the Gaussian integers, we will eventually show that every Euclidean domain is in fact a unique factorization domain. And that's the theorem we have in front of us. If R is a Euclidean domain, then R is a unique factorization domain. The converse, however, is not true. So it turns out that if you take the integers 
and you consider this with a square root of negative 19. And so this is now the set of the ring of the elements of the form a plus b times the square root of negative 19. a, b, and the integers. This is a unique factorization domain, but not a Euclidean domain. So in other words, we have rings where we can still prove an analog of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, yet not have a division theorem. And so these types of rings will require a special approach that the method that we have utilized for the Gaussian integers does not allow. The next thing we are going to do is now show that the notion of prime that we considered in our course for the Gaussian integers is in fact the same as the concept of irreducible whenever we have a unique factorization domain. So in other words, we're going to see that prime and irreducible are both equivalent definitions in the setting of a unique factorization domain, a ring in which we have a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So let's go ahead and prove this. So here's the dilemma. If R is a unique factorization domain, then P and R is prime if and only if it is irreducible. So let's go ahead and prove this. So actually, it will turn out that prime is always going to imply irreducible. And so we're not going to be using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, but rather the fact that in these rings, we have the integral domain condition, that a, b is equal to 0 implies that a is equal to 0, or b is equal to 0. And so just keep that in mind, that when proving the forward direction, we don't need this here to be the case. So here's the proof. So let's suppose, oops, and we're going to be doing the forward direction. So let me go ahead and do that. Suppose P and R is prime. And what we want to show is that this is irreducible. So by definition, we want to take p is equal to a times b, and show that 1 of a, or b is a unit. So next, let p be equal to a times b for some a and b in the ring. Since p is prime, so here we use the definition, since p is prime, we have, by definition, that p divides a, or p divides b. Without loss of generality, let us go ahead and suppose that p divides a. Then, there exists some, in, some k in the ring such that we have that p times k is equal to a. So now, observe that we have p, which is equal to a times b, which is equal to pk times b. But now this is the same after subtracting on one uh, this portion over here to the p. This is the same as saying p minus pkb is equal to 0, which we can factor and have 1 minus kb is equal to 0. But now, we know that p is, so we know by our construction that p is not 0. So since p is not equal to 0, and r is, in this case, it's in, we're assuming it's a Euclidean unique factorization domain, but in the language of abstract algebra, it's an integral domain. And again, Integral domain is just a reference to this condition right here. 
that we have a, that the zero theorem holds. A, B is equal to zero implies A is equal to zero, or B is equal to zero for each A and B. And so using that property, we get that one minus KB is equal to zero, which is the same as one equals K times B, which implies that B is a unit. But if B is a unit, that, that is what we wanted to prove, because we went with our loss of generality, that P divides A, and we needed to show that one of A or B is a unit. So thus, P is irreducible. And so we got one direction. So let's now do the converse. And so in this case, we actually will be using the fact that the ring has a fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that it is a unique factorization domain. So suppose P is um, irreducible. If P divides a times B for some A, B, and R, then by definition, we know that if P divides A times B, we can find some K in the ring such that P times K is equal to A times B. But we know that the ring is a unique factorization domain. And so since R is a unique factorization domain, we have that A is equal to P1, P2, all the way to some P sub, let's go ahead and call it P sub T, and P is equal to Q1, Q2, all the way to some Q sub L, with each P sub J, Q sub J, and irreducible. And so we're just using, now in this case, we're just using the fact that A and B factor into a product of primes. Uh, sorry, I use primes out of habit, but it factors into a product of irreducible elements. So we have this factorizations for A and B, but now let's go ahead and plug into, into A and B with the equation PK is equal to A times B. So thus, PK is going to be equal to P1, P2, all the way to PT, that's A. But then it's also equal to Q1, Q2, all the way to QL. But now, we know that this factorization, now here we use the fact that you, it's R is U of D. We know that this, is, this factor is unique up to order and unit. Since, so now since P, since R is a U of D and P is irreducible, we have that there, that there exists some unit, let's go ahead and call it U, such that P is equal to U times Q sub J, or P is equal to U times P sub J for some J. Because over here, of course, we have a unique factorization. And of course, if we go ahead and say that K factors off into primes, into irreducibles, then P times the irreducible of K, we, get, we have that then P must be equal to one of these here times a unit, since P is irreducible, and each of these Pj's and Qj's is it's also irreducible. And so we got this there, it is here. But if that's the case, then we are done. 
because now we have that in particular p divides one of these qj's or pj's so we have that p divides a or b so if p if if this happens if b is equal to u times qj for some j then p will divide our b since that's the definition of b and if p is equal to u times p sub j then we have that p divides a so therefore p divides a or p divides b which shows that p is prime and that concludes the proof we are done and so this is a sample of how arguments in this abstract approach go. We only use the fact that we had a unique factorization domain. And so we have a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And with that, we can now prove this converse. And so the main thing is that if we now go back to the setting of the Gaussian integers, we see that the definition we used, while it took into account the aspects of being irreducible and prime, it was okay because in the setting of the Gaussian integers, these two concepts are equivalent. And so this is, these are, this is sort of a preview for those of you who have not taken abstract algebra of how arguments in this general setting can go. Because by assuming you have a unique factorization domain, we don't have to do what we did for the Gaussian integers for every, U, um, every Euclidean domain, for every ring that we have a division, uh, a division theorem. Instead, if we have a ring and we prove that it has a division theorem, that is, Euclidean, it is a Euclidean domain, then the whole theory that corresponds to Euclidean domain applies to that ring. And so we reduce the workload that we have to do by considering these things in its abstraction. But now, how does all of this tie back to Fermat's theorem? And the answer lies with the failure of unique factorization, which is at the heart of the proof of Fermat's theorem in the 1800s. That's the difficulty that Euler had for why his proof in, the, in 1753 was incorrect, and it will take almost 20 years for it to get fixed. And this idea, even though Euler made a slip in his argument, he fixed it, but its crucialness to the proof did not really take center stage and it led to one of the biggest dramas that happened in the history of mathematics, and it starts off in the year 1847 at the Paris Academy of Science. So Gabriel Lemay was one of the names that we saw in the, in the historical timeline for Fermat's theorem. He proved the n equals to 7 case in 1839, and in the, at that time he was the premier expert on Fermat's theorem, and he was working towards proving Fermat's theorem. And in 1847, he did just that, or he believed that he had proven Fermat's theorem. He had a proof, he felt absolutely correct about it, and he decided, instead of publishing it, to present it at the next meeting of the Paris Academy of Science. What better way to demonstrate his massive accomplishment than to announce the proof publicly during one of the meeting's lectures. And that's what he did. On March 1st, 1847, Gabriel Lemay gave a lecture in which he proved Fermat's theorem. And that did not go well with the audience. Amongst the mathematicians in attendance is Joseph Louisville, whose name you may have seen in your analysis courses. And Louisville adamantly said, this is not a correct proof. And to quote Edwards, Louisville, for his part, however, did not share LeMay's enthusiasm, and he took the floor after LeMay finished his presentation only to cast some doubt on the proposed proof. He declined any credit for himself in the idea of introducing complex numbers. And so this idea of introducing complex numbers is the one that we saw in our course that dates back to Lagrange, specifically this factorization that we have been considering. And so we, we saw this a couple of lessons ago that we have x to the n plus a, we have this factorization, and with that in mind, 
the Fermat equation in the Fermat's last theorem allows us to, this, to do factor z to the p as this product over the complex numbers. And so Gabriel LeMay wrongly attributed this factorization to Louisville. And so this is where we have over here that he de Louisville declined any credit for having taken that, for having done that factorization from Mosa's theorem. While he had published a, a previous paper that used that factorization, it was not due to him. Lagrange was the first to, Lagrange's work set the stage to deduce this factorization as we have done. And so Louisville pointed out that many others, among them Euler, Lagrange, Gauss, Cauchy, and above all, Jacobi, whom we have not discussed but we'll talk about briefly in our next lesson, had used complex numbers in similar ways in the past and practically said that LeMay's, LeMay's brainchild was among the first ideas that would suggest themselves to a competent mathematician approaching the problem for the first time. And this is accurate. Dating back to 1770, this factorization was well known, or at least in, especially in the by 1840s, it was well known. And that was the way that the attacks went. We saw that with um, Tophi Germain's argument. Rather than dealing with the complex numbers, the beauty of her argument is that by using the auxiliary prime, there was no need to factor it further. But then we had the x minus y times the rest of the, of the of the factor. And so we continue. What was more, he observed, is that LeMay's proposed proof had what appeared to him to be a very large gap in it. Would LeMay be justified, he asked, in concluding that each factor was an nth power if all he had shown was that the factors were relatively prime and their, fact and their product was an nth power? Of course, this conclusion would be valid in the case of ordinary integers but its proof depends on the factorization of integers into prime factors. And it is by no means obvious that the needed techniques can be applied to the complex numbers that LeMay needed for them. Louisville felt that no enthusiasm was justified unless or until these difficult matters had been resolved. And what Gabriel LeMay had done is in his proof of Fermat's last theorem, he assumed incorrectly that if we work in a ring that contains the p roots of unities, that this is a unique factorization domain. And if it's, it is a unique factorization domain, then that means that z to the p has the following, that this is, this is gonna be equal to this, but now LeMay assumed that it was a unique factorization domain. And then he showed that each of these x plus omega p's to the jy, that they are all relatively prime. And because they're equal to a p power, each of the factors themselves have to be a p power. But that requires knowledge of having a unique factorization domain. Because as we saw in just, in just a moment ago, with 6 in the integers adjoined the square root of negative 5, we need to be very careful because we don't necessarily have unique factorization in general. And so we had, in our previous example, two different factorizations of six. And what LeMay had claimed was, if this here, six in this case is not a perfect square, but hypothetically, let's say that we had a perfect square here, then LeMay wanted to say that if things are relatively prime, then themselves they have to be perfect squares, like we have over the integers. But if it's not a unique factorization domain, there is no guarantee that that will hold. And that's exactly what Louisville was pointing out. But now, while Louisville was arguing along these lines, not everyone sided with Louisville. And so this led to a role with the Paris Academy of Science. There were mathematicians like Pierre Wenzel, who said that LeMay was right. 15 days later, he gave a lecture in which he said Gabriel LeMay's work is true and he has verified it. And what Pierre Wenzel did was show that the integers adjoin the second root of unity, 
the integers adjoin the third root of unity and the integers adjoin the fourth root of unity when so proved that these are all unique factorization domains. And here's the kicker. He concluded that because these three are unique factorization domains, that this implies automatically that if we take the integers adjoin omega p for any prime, actually, no, he went even further. He said for any n, so if we take the n fruit of unity, for any n greater than or equal to 5, then this is a UFD. And that is not true at all in general. In fact, Wenzel went one step further. He said that because these are true, then it, is e it easily follows that this is true. And LeMay agreed. Actually, LeMay said that his work, the method of factoring the complex numbers in question, so this the, the, the factorization for z to the p, and that all of his examples confirmed the existence of unique factorization into primes. So he was certain that there can be no insurmountable obstacle between such a complete verification and an actual proof. And so they were basing this on intuition, on examples. They were doing the same thing that Pierre de Fermat had done two centuries prior. Because this holds for a few cases, it must hold in general. And what makes this actually even more ridiculous is that Wenzel never didn't even do anything new. If we look at the definition for the roots of unity, we have that omega n is equal to e to the 2 pi i over n. And we also have Euler's formula, which is e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i, I sine theta. And so if, we go, if you go through and now use Euler's formula with omega sub 2, we have e to the pi i, that is just negative 1. We have omega sub 3, that's 2 pi i over 3, which is going to give us negative 1 half plus root 3 over 2. And actually, square root of negative root 3 over 2, since we're going to have that i being multiplied. So we have that for omega 3. We also have that omega 4 is just i. So in other words, this here is just nothing else but the integers. Omega sub 3 is the Eisenstein integers. And Euler showed this to be a unique factorization domain, or at least his work showed that it was a unique factorization domain in 1770. And the integers that join omega 4 is just the Gaussian integers which Gauss had already shown almost a, a decade prior, in 1834, that that was a unique factorization domain. And so Wenzel did not do anything new. And in the case of the integers, it's like, well, duh. It's like we know that from Euclid, as we have seen in this course. And, but he made the argument that because these three cases are true, then it follows that this is always going to be true for n greater than or equal to 5. But in the same way that when LeMay spoke originally 15 days prior, Louisville rose up in anger. When Wenzel uh, came up to give his lecture and said this, another famous mathematician was in attendance, and that was Cauchy. And he did not take kindly to Wenzel's claims. And Cauchy immediately, after the talk, told Wenzel, and publicly humiliated him. This is not true, what you have done is not new, and this requires solid proof. And for the weeks that followed, Cauchy began to publish papers on a weekly basis to demonstrate the task that actually is needed to fill in the major gap that LeMay and Wenzel were taking for granted without proof or verification. In the process, what Cauchy aimed to do was show that the integers that join a p root of unity is not necessarily a unique factorization domain. So he was seeking a counterexample.
And this is what Coach Lee devoted himself to do for the next uh, couple of months. But we now move over to April and we go over to Berlin to the Prussian Academy of Science. And by then, word had reached the Prussian Academy that Gabriel LeMay had proven Fermat's theorem, or claimed to have proven Fermat's theorem. And this came to the attention of Ernst Kummer, a member of the Academy, who found it hilarious because he had already shown that the integers adjoin um, the 23rd root of unity is not a unique factorization domain. And for those of you who are curious, our textbook actually runs through Kummer's 1844 proof. So 1844, um, the integers adjoin omega 23 is not a UFD. So in other words, we don't have a fundamental theorem of arithmetic for this ring. And our textbook, homework exercise, so exercise uh, 15.2, number 17, has a guided proof, has a guided uh, proof of this. So this is not a sign for homework, but if you're curious on attempting this historical thread, I highly encourage you to look at 15.2.17, which shows that Gabriel and May's proof fails because at its heart, is the fact that the integers adjoin omega p for any prime p greater than 2 is a unique factorization domain. And so that is not the case. But we can then say, well, he was wrong, but it is true for the integers adjoin omega p where p is odd and less than or equal to 19. So it holds for that case, and that right there is an improvement. Let us keep in mind that for the, the primes that it had been shown up to this point was 3, 5, and 7, and of course 4 that dates back to Debussy. And so LeMay, LeMay had now done, in addition to having done 7 in 1839, his incorrect proof showed that Fermat's theorem held for 11, for 13, for 17, and 19. And so that right there is a vast improvement. We've gotten more exponents. Unfortunately for LeMay, Coomer had been, the reason why Coomer was focusing on this was that he was also investigating for Mossa's theorem, although not initially. Coomer, a student of Jacobi, had been approaching questions that also led from work of Eisenstein. So the idea of cubic and quartic reciprocity extending the law of quadratic reciprocity to not just those uh, perfect squares or perfect cubes, perfect fourth powers modulo n, but just modulo some natural number n, so, sorry, uh, for any perfect uh, nth power. And so what is the nth reciprocity law? And it turns out that in order to study these questions, you need to study these rings. And so Coomer was an expert in studying the structure of these rings and he realized that his work on reciprocity, because these are the natural rings of study for Mossa's theorem, that he could now apply what he had been working on to for Mossa's theorem. And that's what he started to do in 1844. And in 1847, he had already shown at the time that for Mossa's theorem, actually that proof that LeMay had done, he had overcome the subtlety that, well, I shouldn't say subtlety because the, the false assumption that LeMay based it on and did fix it to, and, did, and took a, a, a way around it and was able to show for Mossa's theorem for a good collection of primes, what we call regular primes. And so Coomer actually wrote to Louisville upon hearing from the Paris Academy of Science. And he wrote, that your question to Louisville, your questioning of LeMay's implicit use of unique factorization had been quite correct. And he enclosed his paper from 1844. And so, as a consequence, we do get that LeMay did prove it for odd primes, p less than or equal to 19. But Coomer had already proven it for regular primes. And so in the letter that he wrote to Louisville, 
um, when uh, Louisville read the letter on May in May. Moreover, the letter that Kumar wrote to Louisville also mentioned that he had already submitted for publication on April 15 a proof of Fermat's theorem for what are known as regular primes. And so Louisville, on May 24, 1847, announced this to the Paris Academy of Science, and it ended any hope that both Lamey and Wenzel, as well as their followers, had in saying that Lamey had finally proven Fermat's theorem. And so to quote math historian and mathematician, uh, Edwards. He writes, Kumar stated that the theory of factorization can be saved by introducing a new kind of complex numbers, which he called ideal complex numbers. These results he had published one year earlier in the Proceedings of the Berlin Academy in resume form, and a complete exposition of them was soon to appear in Krell's journal. He had for a long time be been occupied with the application of his new theory to Fermat's theorem, and said he had see, succeeded in reducing its proof for a given n to, testing, to the testing of two conditions on n. For the details of this application and of the two conditions, he refers to the notice that was published on 15 April 1847 in the Proceedings of the Berlin Academy. And so what is this notion of an ideal complex number? And this is the foundations for the modern theory of, ring, of rings as it was introduced by Emmy Noether. And so the notion is actually rather simple. So let's go ahead and take a ring R and take an element A in that ring. We are going to call the ideal number of A to be this bracket A, and that's the set of all elements in the ring that are multiples of A. So we have the set AR where R is an R. And if we do this, we can define multiplication of two ideal numbers. And that's exactly what Coomer did. And so we have A and B. These are two ideal numbers. We can define the multiplication to simply be AR times BS for some RS and R. But then we have that this is ABRS, RS and R, but R times S is an element of the ring. So that's just simply, after relabeling, that's just some R. And so we're looking at a, b times r, r and r. So we get the ideal number for a times b. In the case of the multiplicative identity, 1, then we have the set of 1 is 1 times r for every r and r. So we just get back the whole ring. And so that is the notion of an ideal number. And so we look at the integers. We have the ideal number for 4. It's just all the multiples of 4. The ideal number for 3 is just all the multiples of 3. And now if we look at the ideal number 4 times the ideal number 3, we get the ideal number 12. But that is going to be two, the ideal number times 2, so all these ideal numbers 2, 2, 3. So we have unique factorization in terms of ideal numbers. If we go over to the Gaussian integers, we have that the ideal, ideal numbers corresponding to 1 plus i and 1 minus i are equal. And so now, back when we talked about the Gaussian integers, we had 1 plus i, 1 minus i, and we showed that they are not relatively prime. They're both prime, but not relatively prime because we have that we can get it, we can get, um, if we take 1 plus i and multiply it negative i, we get back 1 minus i. But in the language of ideal numbers, we have that these two ideal numbers are the same. And so by allowing ourselves to introduce ideal numbers, we do away with having to say that these are the same prime up to unit, or more to be precise, the same irreducibles up to unit. For example, let's come back to the integers in this example. The ideal number for 4 is the same as the ideal number for negative 4. And so when we talk about primes in this new setting, we don't have to talk about units. So negative 5 and 5, they're the same primes over the integers, but we have to have that distinction when it's positive, when it's negative. In the setting of ideal numbers, that distinction goes away. The positive and negatives don't play a role 
by considering these sets. And that leads us to define the notion of a prime ideal number. And so a, an ideal number is said to be prime if a, b is in the ideal number p, then that implies that a is in the ideal number p or b is in the ideal number p. But what you should do now is verify that this definition for ideal numbers, this is just really the definition we just used for what it means to be prime over an arbitrary commutative ring earlier. And so I should also mention that the ideal number zero is under this definition prime. And so that is a difference from how we think about numbers. Over the integers, we don't consider, we, zero is not prime. We always remove zero. But a consequence of this definition is that in the case of the ideal number zero, then we have that for each a and b in the ideal number zero, so just a set zero, then we have that that will just consist of zero, so any product of the form, because a times b is equal to zero implies a is equal to zero, or b is equal to zero, then we get that zero is in fact prime. And so that's just one tiny uh, departure from what we are used to over the integers and the Gaussian integers, is that now we have to allow ourselves to consider zero to be prime in this setting. And so Emmy Noether, building on work of Richard Dedekin, whose work had been specific to the ideas of that arose from Fermat's theorem and the rings that arise in number theory, Emmy Noether introduced a general setup. And so what Emmy Noether did was define the notion of an ideal, building on Coomer and Dedekin. And this is the right structure to really understand how a ring behaves. And so specifically, we say a subset i of a ring r is an ideal if the following hold. If we have x and y in the ideal, then it's closed under addition, then x plus, I, x plus y is also in the ideal. If x is in the ideal, then the additive inverse of x is in the ideal itself as well. If x is in the ideal and r is in the ring, then we have that r times x is an i. And we say that an ideal of r is prime if a, b, and i implies that a is an i or b is an i. And so this generalizes Coomer's notion of an ideal number. Because in the same way that we define multiplication for two ideal numbers, we can define multiplication for two ideals. If we have i and j, ideals of r, we can take i times j to be defined as the following set of elements, where we're like now, we are now looking at sums of products. So we're looking at all the sums of products of the form aj times bj, where now aj is an i, bj is an j, for n, and of course here n is a fixed natural number, so this is a finite sum of products. And with this definition, Dedekin was able to show in 1894 that what Coomer had been exploiting for Fermat's last theorem was really a unique factorization that held more generally for the integers that join omega p, where omega p is a p root of unity. And so these are called the p cyclotomic rings. And so specifically, Dedekin showed that if we take an ideal i, of the integers that join omega p, then that ideal factors uniquely up to order into a product of prime ideals of the integers that join omega p. So in other words, we have that i is going to be equal to a product of prime ideals, this gothic p, and then we have e to the j's. And so now we have that if we switch over to working over these new definitions of rings and ideals, we, even though we don't have a unique factorization domain necessarily, we still have the next best thing. We still have a fundamental theorem of arithmetic in the setting of ideals. And that's what Dedekind showed. And that is the, the, what um, Coomer had exploited almost 50 years prior. And so this gets us to Coomer's theorem. And so 
Homer define for a prime number p, we say that p is a regular prime if each ideal i of the integers adjoined the p fruit of unity, satisfying that i to the p is equal to an ideal number a. So here i is now some ideal, and a is an actual ideal number. So if we have this here, then i itself is equal to an ideal number b for some b in the integers of join omega p. So in modern language, there's a concept, uh, there's a, a, a certain structure that quantifies this information. It's known the class group of the integers of join omega p. And in that language of groups, what we end up having is that to be a regular prime is to say that p does not divide this class group that I mentioned. And so that's just the, the way that it's phrased today. But in the language of Homer, this is the way that it was used. And so Homer showed that if p is a regular prime, then for Ma's last theorem it is true. Unfortunately, we do not have the time, and it does require more techniques from abstract algebra, so specifically the branch of math known today as algebraic number theory, to prove this theorem. But the way that the proof goes is by using Sophie Germain's breaking of Fermat's last theorem into two cases. So Kumar proves Fermat's last theorem case one for regular primes, and then he does Fermat's last theorem for the second case for regular primes. And both together, of course, then get from Massa's theorem for regular primes. And so his proof is still based on the system that Sophie Germain had established for proving for Massa's theorem. So to finish off for today, I'm going to go through and sort of give a quick rundown of how Coomer used this notion of a regular prime and how this is utilized in the proof itself, but just to give a get, get a taste of the ideas that go into it. But as I mentioned, we will require more techniques and tools that we don't have at our disposal to give this justice. And so at the start of the proof, and this is what we're going to be covering, is the factorization. So we know that x to the p is going to be equal to the product. Oh, so first off, let me start again. So we're going to suppose towards a contradiction. Suppose towards a contradiction that there exists x, y, and z natural numbers such that x to the p plus y to the p is equal to z to the p for some regular prime p. Now, we can go ahead and write x to the p is equal to z to the p minus y to the p. By Lagrange, we know that this here is equal to the product from j is equal to 0 to p minus 1 of z minus the p root of unity raised to the j times y. And so we got this factorization, so nothing new as of now. And Coomer's proof follows a similar trend to LeMay's proof of that same year. Just that what LeMay did that got him in trouble was that he assumed that this here, and that, that if we consider the prime factors of x to the p, then they will have the same prime factors here. And that is not true necessarily. But Coomer bypassed it by going to his ideal numbers, because we have an equality in terms of here's x to the p, and here is elements inside the integers adjoined, omega p. And so then Coomer passed on to the ideal number. So he considered the ideal number of x to the p, and this is going to be equal to the product of the ideal numbers where now we have ideal numbers z minus omega p to the j y. And so we have these ideal numbers right here. 
and these are all rays, well sorry, they're not rays yet, so we have this here, this equality. But now, Dedekind's result shows that we have a unique factorization in terms of the prime ideals in here. And so what Coomer showed was that the, essentially what, um, um, this is incorrect, but the extension of what is now the GCD in this setup, but we have to be careful how to define that. What Coomer showed was that these are red v prime. And again, this is just to give intuition, but this is technically a not, a non, not correct statement. Since we don't have a GCD of ideals, there is a way of making sense of it. But this is just to use notation that we are used to. And so this is equal to 1 if j does not equal to k. So in other words, these quantities are relatively prime. The precise wording for it in commutative algebra and abstract algebra is that the ideals corresponding to these two elements are co-prime. And so what, if we have this result here, and we have a perfect p power on the left, then we have the lemma that we use right before Diophantus' result. So specifically, we have the following statement. And so we showed for the integers that if we have z to the n is equal to d times e, where d and e are relatively prime, then d and e are perfect nth powers. It turns out that that same result holds in the context of ideals. If we have that some ideal to the some ideal number to the nth power is equal to the product of rel relatively prime ideal numbers, then each of those ideal numbers is itself a perfect nth power. And so with the analog of that result, Coomer showed then that this year we have the following. So I'm going to just go ahead and put this as by the extension of that lemma. What we get is that the ideal number x to the p is now equal to the product from j is equal to 0 to p minus 1. But now we have ideals i sub j to the p where i j to the p is equal to z minus omega p to the j times y. So here, this is just some ideal. And so now, that's the key, the, the key difference with the original proof. But now, here's where we have the, the, where the proof goes in the, using the fact that we have unique factorization in the sense of Dedekin. Because the only reason why we can prove this extension of the lemma is because by Dedekin's theorem, we have unique factorization in terms of prime ideals. And because of this unique factorization, the argument that we did for the integers, it holds verbatim when passing to ideals. And so just in the same way that we copy-pasted our proofs for the integers, in the, for the Gaussian integers and made adjustments where necessary, we can do the same exact thing with extending the lemma to arbitrary rings once we have a notion of what it means to be relatively prime and having unique factorization in terms of prime ideals. And we can prove that result. And so we have that this here is equal to a product of perfect p powers. And now we use the fact that p is a regular prime. Because now we have that i, since i is a regular prime, we have that if i to the p is equal to some ideal number, which is exactly what we have here. We have that i j to the p is equal to an ideal number. So that means that i is equal to some ideal number b for some element b in the integers adjoin omega p. And so now, since p is regular, since p is a regular prime, we have that i, j, or I should say there exists, b sub j in the integers of join omega p, such that the ideal number of b sub j is equal to, 
i sub j for each j. And so we got this here. So therefore, we have that x to the p is equal to the product from j is equal to 0 to p minus 1, ij to the p, but now the ij's are each b sub j raised to the p, and now this in turn implies that there exists some unit u, such that x to the p, sorry, such that x is equal to the product of the b sub j's. times the unit. Oops, I forgot the unit at the front. And so we got this here. And so we were able to have that x can be written as this b sub this unit times these b sub j's, where each b sub j is intricately tied to the factors from the original equation. And that's exactly what Lemay had done. Lemay had assumed you need factorization. And so we have that he said we have x to the p. These are all going to be relatively prime. And therefore, they're going to be perfect p powers. So we have that these are all going to be some p sub b's, b's to some p's. And then we have that x to the p is equal to those products, that product. And we can have that x is equal to just after removing the p powers, x is equal to the corresponding product without the p powers. But that was flawed because he assumed a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Kummer bypassed everything by going on towards this notion of ideal numbers and using the statement and still came back to the same uh, setup that Lemay had done. But Kummer's proof also improved significantly ideas, other ideas that Lemay had not rigorously shown. And so while LeMay did have the right strategy if unique factorization held, he, took, he still took other intuitive leaps that needed justification, whereas Coomer's proof was solid and justified. And this is, in, in many ways, the foundations for modern abstract algebra when we trace the arguments, because Coomer introduced ideal numbers for proving from Oslo's theorem. Almost 50 years later, Dedekin came in and realized that the, these ideal numbers that Coomer introduced could be this unique factorization they exploit in a special case actually holds for the whole ring. And then in the years that followed, mathematicians also realized that what Dedekin had done in this special case held more generally for a wide class of rings, which we today call, in Dedekin's honor, Dedekin domains. And so these are rings where we always have unique factorization in terms of prime ideals. And then Emmy Noether came by and ex generalized all these notions that had arisen in number theory and, and said, there is nothing special about these considerations that are popping up in number theory. They hold more generally. And in her honor, the study of commutative rings or a, 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 a wide class of commutative rings are known as Noetherian rings. And so that is the story of Fermat's theorem up to 1847. Our next two videos will have us investigate the path from Fermat's theorem to the modern proof. And so our next lesson is going to talk about modular forms. And so this is an idea that dates back to around the, around the time of Coomer, just a few decades prior. And this language of modular forms, while not explicitly stated in that way then, would be rigorously defined by Dedekin around the same time as his result that extended this notion of Coomer. And so we're going to see mod uh, modular forms from a modern angle, introduce, introduce the modern definition, and do some examples with them. And then finally, our last lesson will have us investigate elliptic curves 
and see how we can connect Fermat's theorem to elliptic curves in modular forms and why Fermat's theorem is true from the considerations that we will be investigating.